Shin Megami Tensei. A name that many don't recognize. A name that many probably wouldn't know about in the modern age, were it not for one franchise. Persona. Persona made its huge debut in the West when Persona 3 released on the PlayStation 2 in 2006, with all of its releases combined, adding up to sell approximately 500,000 units worldwide. For Atlas, it was pretty impressive, and for the people who did buy it, they loved it. Thus, we got Persona 4 and its abundant amount of spin-offs, and Persona 5, the game that no one can stop talking about. But Persona often overshadows every other JRPG, including Shin Megami Tensei itself. Persona was originally a spin-off of the SMT series, much like other popular or cult classic franchises you may recognize. Digital Devil Saga, Devil Summoner, Devil Survivor, etc. But the mainline Shin Megami Tensei franchise fell under hard times once Persona reared its head into the gaming landscape once P3 came out. I bring this all up because the predecessor to Persona, Digital Devil Saga, Devil Summoner, and others are all thanks to a huge cult classic released during the PlayStation 2's earlier years. The third mainline installment of Shin Megami Tensei paved the way for all future entries for Atlas going forward. Everything from the battle systems and its variations of such, to the dungeon design, the game's themes, all of it points to 2003's Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne. Much like in my last effort, development for SMT Nocturne is difficult to find, since many of the articles I found during the research process were taken down or are in Japanese, and couldn't be translated to get exact quotes. And I don't know Japanese or anyone who can translate for them, so unfortunately, the most amount of concrete research I could show off to viewers is the official Atlas behind the scenes DVD that was translated by a fan. Partially. The video is 22 minutes long and even has a celebration feast with many of the members of the development team, where they reminisce on the development troubles of SMT3. I recommend you watch this if you're at all interested in the development process. I'll link it in the description. From what I've got though, this is the history of Nocturne's development. Nocturne as a concept started all the way back in 1994, after the release of SMT2 on the Super Famicom. The reason why there was such a huge gap between the release of SMT2 and 3 is because the team behind Nocturne was very lost when it came to where to take the series after 2. Atlas originally planned on only releasing three games in the mainline SMT series, SMT1, 2, and SMT IF. After that, they planned on turning Nocturne into its own game without the SMT moniker attached to it. And even as the PlayStation and Sega Saturn released, the team at Atlas felt like they couldn't do what they wanted to do with Nocturne yet, since the hardware wasn't powerful enough. Katsura Hashino admitted that the team kept asking questions in regards to what they wanted to do with Nocturne. Questions such as, how far can we take this, and what can we do by ourselves? They asked these questions since Atlas wanted to make the game appeal to a wider demographic compared to its predecessors, which is something that wouldn't even happen until the year 1999, when the PlayStation 2 was announced at the Tokyo Game Show. Atlas mentioned that there would be an upcoming SMT title in the works, including a mainline entry. 
The team was able to get their hands on a PS2 and cobble together a prototype, used to see how powerful the PS2 could be. A prototype of a Cerberus was used and shown at the 2000 Tokyo Game Show, using five PS2s connected over a LAN system, allowing a whole tech demo to be played to test the PS2 further. These were all used to see how developers could model and animate demons into the game. And it worked. All of that testing was good enough to allow the development team to begin work on SMT3 in 2000, after this tech demo was shown to the world. A big hurdle for the development team was how this game was going to be among the first game in Atlas's repertoire to be made in 3D, along with SMT9, a game that us Westerners were redeemed unworthy of. The 3D itself was tested in a place known as Ueno Zoo, which eventually became Yoyogi Park. The area was a playground to see how developers could have the player move around in the world. Compared to the final product, the alpha build is significantly stiffer. Reminds me of tank controls in a way. Much about the game was different or coming into its own during the alpha build, like the battle system seen here. Battles were significantly different compared to the final product. Demons were just humanoid models with their artwork attached to their faces. The battle layout was different. Backgrounds were non-existent at this point. The UI was different, cluttering up most of the screen. Along with all of this, the press turn system that would become iconic to Nocturne and the following SMT games didn't seem to exist at this point. Now that gameplay is out of the way, there's also the subject of the world and character design. Kazuma Kaneko, otherwise known as the Demon Designer, and is the culprit to a lot of the reasons why Nocturne has such a huge personality. Speaking about the Vortex world itself, Kaneko describes the process of creating the Vortex world as asking a simple question first. What is chaos? As he went on to describe how the people of the world are not well, describing them as being too obsessed with themselves, and because of that, the earth is slowly becoming clogged, as he called it. The flow of things was being interrupted, which became the idea for the inverted design of the Vortex world. It makes sense as the perspective of the development team wanted to make a game feel like a journey into hell. The barren landscape of the Vortex world in the alpha and beta builds was similar to the final product, though from what was shown, there were many less buildings and much more of a large distance between them, like the world had been extremely ravaged in some way. Not that it wasn't in the final product, but compared to the original builds, this was significantly different. The series' traditional law, chaos, and neutral alignments were intact, though changed somewhat. The idea behind the Vortex world, the story, and the creation and destruction of this new world was birthed from a new concept called Reasons. These Reasons were ideologies given to each of the main cast, who would begin to form as the game goes on, and eventually, after gaining enough power and resources, would become the character's driving force for continuing to fight. The franchise's main producer, Koji Okada, went out into Tokyo to examine the cities that would be used in the game's world. The four ones highlighted during that development DVD were Shinjuku, Shibuya, and Asakusa. I apologize if I butchered any of those names. He went through these cities and examined how he felt while walking through its streets, which in turn gave Okada ideas for the reasons and how each one manifested. Something that the team wanted to implement that was somewhat related to the reasons were giant demons that would fight each other in the cities of the game, but they were cut from the final release since it was merely only a concept. The third person camera was also something new for the series, since Kaneko wanted the game to have the player character, known as the Demi-Fiend, visible at all times. Speaking of the Demi-Fiend, Kaneko was inspired by, of all things, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah, the band when thinking of Demifiend's design, as he, quote, imagined him running around the desert naked, end quote. Kaneko also got the idea for Demifiend's design from looking at shamans, and the tattoos on their bodies, which is how Kaneko got the idea for Demifiend's full body tattoos, which had led him to becoming an iconic character from his design alone. Even the metal rod, which in the game is known as the Magatama that's in the Demifiend's neck, appeared from an idea that people's aura manifested as a shark fin sticking out of the back of their neck from the side. The characters were also highlighted during that DVD, primarily Yuko Takao, the teacher who was partially responsible for the creation of the Vortex world. Okada mentioned in the DVD that he and the team wanted Yuko to act as a different kind of female character in the story. They wanted her to be conflicted in what she wanted, since she doesn't possess a reason in the game's narrative. They were vague about the details, but it seemed like in past entries, female characters were obviously less conflicted about their own ideas than Yuko was. Koji Okada wanted to create a new world in the SMT universe. 
The idea at first was to continue off the world built up in SMT2, but after Okada and Kazuma Kaneko rejected those ideas, wanting to return to a modern setting for SMT3 instead of the science fiction of SMT2. The game was actually originally known as SMT3 Vortex, before the devs settled on Nocturne to add for the subtitle. Now that that's all out of the way, then there's the cut content. And, well, there, there's a fuck ton of cut content, like oh my goodness. Thanks to the cutting room floor for finding all this stuff, because much of this was lost to my knowledge. I'll link the page in the description, but I'll just give an overview of the alpha and beta versions and what was lost, because if I went into everything, this section could approximately be 20 minutes long. There was. Unused models for characters, unused and cut areas, the puzzle minigame was different, the different puzzles for you to solve, unused cutscenes and cinematics, unused battle dialogue, unused level dialogue, unused items, unused skills, and so much more. There was even an unused script that was found in the full official release of Nocturne that contained what seemed to be an early story that was separate from the overall main narrative of the game. It's really fascinating, but unfortunately, the original tech demo is lost to us forever so we don't have any real reference other than the few clips taken off the website itself. It's absolutely astonishing what Atlas was planning to put into Nocturne, despite the fact that full development took place over the course of a single year. Even though the team started work on Nocturne in 2000, when the PS2 launched, full development on Nocturne didn't start until 2002, a year out from the official release. And even after the original version came out in 2003, the West got the special Director's Cut version, which added Dante from the Devil May Cry series, which spawned a meme in and of itself. It added an extra dungeon, added a whole new ending to the game, and is considered the definitive way to play it, which is what I'll be looking at. And no, I did not play the Nocturne Remastered Edition. Even though it's successful on PS4, Steam, and the Nintendo Switch, because of course it is, after hearing about how catastrophic the launch was, with how poor the technical performance was even after patches, and with how many basic features like removing the uncompressed audio or adding manual skill inheritance wasn't implemented, they did eventually make some patches that fixed some of the frame rate issues and added in some quality of life improvements. But at the time when it was first released, I had already put two playthroughs into the game and I was not going to buy a $60 to $50 game just to play through it in HD again. Regardless, Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne was released on February 20th, 2003 in Japan, and on October 12th, 2004 in North America. Atlas's games have always been very unique to the general gaming public. Most of the JRPG genre has been populated with either traditional turn-based games, or action RPGs. Speaking of the turn-based side for a moment, there's always been an underlying problem with games like Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, at least for me. When going through these games, it can feel like you're just going through the motions sometimes. You aren't really punished for turning your brain off when getting into battles, since you don't need to worry about enemies killing you or making too many mistakes. These games are usually easy enough, and you don't have to think about too many complex mechanics to keep track of. Atlas doesn't get that memo. And with Nocturne, their battle system completely flips that idea on its head. Nocturne's most influential mechanic, the press turn battle system, has become easily one of the best parts about Nocturne after all these years. What makes the press turn system so good compared to other JRPGs is that it's always been able to keep the player engaged. How it basically works is that you have these little icons in the top right of the screen. These indicate your turns and how many actions you can perform per turn. These increase depending on how many party members you have, up to a max of 4. When you perform any action, it uses up one of your turns, typical RPG stuff. What's different about this is that when you get critical hits, or more commonly, when you exploit an enemy's weakness, you'll only use up what's known as a half turn, and the icon will pulse. When it comes to weaknesses, let me give an example. Say your enemy is weak to lightning attacks. If you have that skill, you can use it, and you'll do more damage, and your turn will extend in a way, and you'll have more opportunities to get through a battle unscathed. Recognizing enemy weaknesses is vital for surviving a Nocturne and every Atlas title going forward. But the beauty with Nocturne's gameplay doesn't just lie in its offensive abilities. There's also defense to worry about, too. When an enemy inevitably gets the chance to attack, they follow the same template you have. If they have a way to exploit your weakness, they will. 
and they can end you just as quickly, but there are ways to mitigate that, mainly resistances. You can have your own resistances to certain elements and attacks. If you do have this, you're able to reduce damage, reflect the damage back at enemies, nullify it completely, or best of all, absorb the damage to get health back. The enemy can do this too, so it's completely even. Plus, these resistances and immunities reduce turns for your enemy and for yourself. These enemies can and will force you to pay attention, since any one of them can end you in a single strike. And losing progress is extremely devastating to lose when it happens. Thankfully, you won't be alone. You've got a merry band of demons to back you up. These demons are your party members and you will get attached to some of them. It's another thing that gives Atlas games the appeal that they have. It's like Pokemon, except it came out before Pokemon. These demons become very reliable and special members of your party, and you won't want to part with them, even when you may have to, more on that later. Each one can provide a different role compared to the Demi-Fiend, and you will need to rely on them at some point down the line. They can and will have moves and abilities that you don't, and you will be forced to rely on them in many situations. It's great that your character can't do everything all at once, and you need to strategize with your party composition to make sure you survive in the Vortex world. All of these ideas combine to make an enjoyable combat system that is very replayable. There isn't much to speak about since if I were to go into every single intricacy of the press turn system, the gameplay section would be full of very long explanations about the tiniest things. What there is to discuss is everything else that surrounds the combat. You can build the demi to your preferences by using the various Magatama you gain while going through the Vortex world. You can make him a Strength user or a Magic user. It's not much, sure, but it's in those movesets in between that makes the game replayable. You can specialize in any of the elements, go for AoE moves that attack everyone, focus on some angle targets, etc. It's great. And while there are some issues with some of the balancing, I'll touch on that later. And while I'm talking about combat, there's the bosses. Bosses in Nocturne are simple and straight to the point. There are occasional gimmick bosses, but for the most part it's the same cycle of combat compared to the normal enemies. Find weaknesses and damage the boss until it dies. Bosses that I enjoy in this game have stuck with me since my first playthrough and have become some of my favorite boss fights in JRPG history. Beelzebub, Metatron, Daisojo, Dante, Kagetsuchi, the Disco Ball, and of course, the fallen angel himself, Lucifer, have all become memorable experiences that, despite the occasional frustration, are memorable experiences that have become the highlights of Nocturne and honestly in my entire gaming career. The combat loop of Nocturne is nearly flawless, and hasn't really aged all that much in 19 years. What has is most of the other things outside of the combat, mainly the dungeon design. Which door did I go through? Oh no! I oh, forgot which one I went through last time! What? Can someone, can someone please explain to me why Nocturne has doors that you could go through in one way, but not the other? Who designed this? Tonight on Buns Loses Our Crap. In what world does that make sense? Someone said center. I'm, I'm gunning for center. Damn it! <laughs> which way is it? I cannot remember which door I went through. Now, if someone could politely please tell me which of these five doors currently going from left to right, which door? One, two, three, four, five. Pick a number because if you're wrong, you're banned. I'm not playing around. It's not the middle! We know it's not the middle one! We know it's not the right! We know it's not one, it's not two, three! Hey, hey, hey Tyler, hey Tyler, I think it's number three. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of my street. Okay, so here we are in front of door number five, all right? Let's see! What's Death. behind oh, number five? God. Now, I will fully admit this, this isn't an objective issue across many of Atlas's titles even to the current day. If you love labyrinthian dungeons that you can get lost in for days with no way of knowing where you're going, you'll love Nocturne. If you don't, I've got some bad news for you. I've never understood why Atlas gets a kick out of designing their dungeons like this, but they've done it for a long time. 
I'm not sure if I can blame Nocturne for having this be a keepsake for the series, but it is the first game in the franchise that I've played that has it. It has carried on to Digital Devil Saga, SMT4, and even partially Persona 3, 4, and 5, though to a much lesser extent. When playing through Nocturne for the first time, I did my best to play through it blind, at least as best as I could without following a guide. I very quickly failed, since I gave up on maybe the third dungeon of the game, and I was already in for a rocky ride when I set the difficulty to hard, which I'll get to in a minute. Going through these dungeons feels like pulling teeth, since due to the nature of these environments, you will get lost, forget where you once were, and if you didn't have that map of yours, you probably wouldn't progress at all unless you were to cross your fingers and get lucky. The biggest example I can point to is the Labyrinth of Amala, the optional dungeon added in the Maniacs re-release. This five-layer dungeon is the bane of my existence. Every floor has multiple complex intricacies to it that make it a chore to navigate. There are invisible floors, teleporting rooms, transparent walls, door puzzles, backtracking, the whole nine yards. And on top of all of that, there are no fountains of life in the dungeon, nor are there any save points or cathedral shadows rooms. Once you go into these dungeons, you either make your way out the hard way, or you transport yourself back out. Because of this, I honestly find Nocturne to be a hard recommendation on the gameplay front without a few caveats, since these dungeons and their stupid puzzles are often the main culprit to my frustration. Along with an above average encounter rate, makes for a gameplay loop that, while enjoyable in certain instances, can get on your nerves a little quickly. Which brings me to the infamous difficulty. A common joke about Nocturne that's beaten shamelessly to a pulp over its entire existence is that Nocturne is the Dark Souls of JRPGs, a statement that isn't at all accurate since Nocturne came first and the games barely have anything in common. Regardless, the game is no cakewalk and will be a challenge to anyone, even veterans and people know what they're doing like myself. My first playthrough that I did not record was done on hard difficulty, as you all already heard. It was certainly difficult, but not in the way you might think. Really, hard mode made the game more tedious than anything, since prices in shops are tripled, meaning a lot of grinding for Baka. Enemies with instant death spells like Hama and Mudo are basically going to hit every time if you don't nullify it. And most importantly, you cannot flee from battles and the encounter rate is arguably even higher than it already is. Gameplay is untouched aside from all of that, but those factors make the game more of a hassle to get through because they just get in the way more often and limit what strategies you can employ. I find the best way to play Nocturne without getting your dick crushed is playing the game on normal difficulty. It allows you to basically do what you want without too much issue. As good as some of the bosses are, there are some that are just slogs, like Nozuchi, who is so frustrating since the confusion spell was the primary reason I wiped so often in my first playthrough. Then there's Trumpeter, the four riders, and many bosses from the main game that are just... meh. Nothing interesting about them, at least to me, even with their gimmicks. And speaking of the bosses, there's some of the party composition problems. Since there are basically some bosses that require certain demons and strategies in order to be successful, you will sometimes need to be very peculiar about your party selection. I use roughly the same amount of demons in my party in both playthroughs to make the process as easily as possible. You know Matador, that infamous boss from Nocturne that everyone says is one of the hardest in the game? A way to make that fight significantly easier is by leveling yourself up to level 18, use Izume, and have her nullify force and use Media to keep yourself healed up. It seriously helps a lot. While discussing the combat, I have to say that while the balancing is still among the better ones in SMT history, physical builds are still very popular for Nocturne and are the way to go about 99% of the time, unless your name is Buffmeister. Seriously man, how the fuck did you do this without Pierce or Frey Google? Strength builds stagnate much in the early game, but late game they become borderline overpowered with screen clearing attacks and devastating single target attacks. Magic, while less powerful, can still be used in very certain situations and even forces the demi in situations where you cannot do much during boss fights, making your party selection far more important compared to other games in the series. However, fusion can be pretty frustrating, since you cannot manually select your skills that you want to pass on to your demons like in later Persona games. You have to close the screen, select the demons again, and pray that the combination you get is what you want. Most of the time, it usually never is going to be perfect, which is why everyone who plays Nocturne ends up usually just setting with mostly good skills on demons, and just rolls with one or two bad ones that end up getting replaced, and why later SMT and Persona games remove this limitation and allow you to select your own skills when creating demons with Personas. 
Other than that, Nocturne's gameplay is still very enjoyable to this day. Despite its faults, I do find it to be the best combat in the franchise. Other entries usually have some major faults that aren't as present in Nocturne's combat movie. It is enjoyable, even with some frustrating parts about it, and I can make it a recommendation to a hardcore JRPG enjoyer. However, I would argue that the reason why Nocturne is so memorable is the other aspect that Atlas is known for. Creating stories. Philosophy is something that Atlas has always kept as an underlying thing in their narratives. From their earliest days, they always had characters and factions that had differing opinions on how they believed people should act and who should govern them. Law, Chaos, and Neutral are the three primary alignments that Shin Megami Tensei has employed, all the way back from the original game. With Nocturne's narrative, Atlas asks the player two simple questions. How would you shape the world if given the chance? and how far are you willing to go to carry out your beliefs. Nocturne begins as you get off a subway train, trying to meet up with your high school friends. As you create their names, you get some background context as to what's about to happen. You hear about a cult that attacked a nearby park in a protest that happened recently. You walk into this abandoned hospital with your friends in search of your teacher who requested that you go there. You explore around, and you eventually find a man sitting in a chair, speaking in a poetic tone, and seems to be ready to kill you. Your teacher walks in, saves your life, and explains that the world is about to end. Everyone outside the hospital will die when the world is reborn. This development is called the Conception, and is a part of a cycle in the universe. When it happens, the world is destroyed, and everyone seems to get sucked into the void and transported to the Vortex world. It's here where you get your first vague objective. Find out where your friends are, find out where your teacher went, find out where that cult member went, and most importantly, discover what you want the world to become. Nocturne doesn't really have an overarching story to keep track of, since much of the dialogue and overall plot is kept to a minimum, and most of the narrative chunks you are given are in the form of breadcrumbs meant to send you to the next dungeon that the game asks of you. One thing that I will keep you engaged is the world itself and the atmosphere it gives off. Everything from the character designs, to the world, to the color palette, the music, everything in Nocturne is otherworldly and mysterious, and I think that it adds to its charm. In fact, charm is the word of the day. Speaking of music, I cannot talk about Atlas's games without mentioning Shoji Meguro, who's become sort of a rock star in the gaming industry thanks to his well-regarded soundtracks. Shoji has always been great at having a mixture of bombastic battle themes and atmospheric melodies. My favorites from this game being Mystery, which I and many others have just nicknamed Pixie's Theme, Heretic Mansion Shining Heaven, Chiaki's theme and the final boss theme.
Though these four songs are just the tip of the iceberg, as I have found so much of the soundtrack to be memorable, since all of it is unique and specific to many locations and moments. Beelzebub's 30 second loop as being another favorite, but it's so short that there really isn't much to say, it just hits all the right notes with me. Despite the fact that the world has literally ended and is inhabited with demons, once you actually get out of the void and are placed in that hospital bed, you quickly see that the demons of this place are kinda... interesting. In a fun way. It seems like they all have personalities of their own, despite all being described as demons. There's the pixie that you meet in the hospital, who acts very flirtatious towards you in certain moments and in the optional dungeon. There's the oni and Ikebukuro, who are basically like the oni mafia, being enforcers to their bosses that live in that giant freaking tower. There's Loki and Nyx, who are very lax and seem to have and know a lot more than they let on. I could continue for a little bit more. It's all very entertaining, and it's a nice breath of fresh air compared to the moody atmosphere of the dungeons, and even partially the world itself. It's nice to see that personality didn't die along with the world. But there aren't just demons wandering about. There's also the other humans, aka your friends, and the mannequins, who are a race of, effectively, mud dolls given life through energy called Magatsuhi, which is also used to help summon gods. Speaking of which, Nocturne gets a whole point from me thanks to one simple... reason. The reasons are a huge part of Nocturne's narrative, as they fuel the driving question I asked at the beginning of this section. The power of creation. Each character who entered that hospital, except for you, ends up finding their own reason to follow, and their reason for continuing to stay alive in the Vortex world. Each one is vastly different from one another and is equally complex in the questions they propose. Each one deserves its own mini-section, which is exactly what I'm going to do here. The first I'll go over is Chiaki, since she is probably the most prevalent character who appears over the course of the game. Chiaki's reasons spawn from her own fear of being too weak. Before the conception occurred, she was a weak, frail human who couldn't do much of anything. Now that she has purpose in the Vortex world, and has the ability to fight, and to gain power, she wishes to create the world of Yosuga, the world of the strong, a world ruled by the Chosen, as she calls it. Along with that, through gaining enough power in Magatsuhi, Chiaki becomes the Ball Avatar, which Ball, in a Western Semitic title, means Master or Lord and through her newfound power, wishes to waltz up to Kagetsuchi and create her own world. This reason most closely aligns with that of a chaos alignment, and even has the concept of social Darwinism in it. Most of the time, the fallen angel Lucifer in chaos is associated with the idea of freedom above all else. Considering that the other reasons in the game are tied down by some sort of ruler, the idea that one can shape their own destiny through their own willpower and strength is compelling. But there's a fundamental issue with this idea. It's a paranoid way to live. Hypothetically, if we were all living like this, we would have to always be watching our backs to ensure that something or someone wouldn't come up and devour us whole in a split moment. It'd be a horrible way to live since you always have to be fighting for your life, just like how the Vortex world is now. It's a reason that I understand due to where Chiaki originated from, but one that I cannot support under an ideal circumstance. Then there's Isamu, who has easily the most isolated reason compared to the others. He believes that, after spending a lot of time in the Amala network, which is basically an area that harnesses the flow of Magatsuhi, that you are the most important person in your own life, that you yourself should be the center of your own universe. You don't care about others, and vice versa. This all stems from the fact that Isamu originally had this sort of laid-back, cool vibe to him, but once the conception occurred, He's shown to be a surprisingly timid guy who isn't really able to do many physical feats. Opposite of Chiaki, in a way. But whereas Chiaki's fear and eventual birth of a reason came from her own fear, Isamu's came from the fact that he was too cowardly in his previous life and just wanted to become the ruler of his own paradise. The world of Masubi was born from this ideology, and with it, the unnamed god who Isamu dubs as Noah. Masubi is actually, at first, glance, one of the better options if you were to think about it. But, unfortunately, there's a big flaw. Humanity cannot change if the world of Masubi were to become a reality. 
Humans would just think all their problems away if they were to be a part of this world without having to worry about anyone to challenge their ideologies and beliefs. Because of this, people will become stagnant and resistant to change. Not that anyone is really changing in this current world we live in anyway. Then, the final main human with a reason is Hikawa, who has the idea of Shijima, a world ruled by order, and primarily stillness, as he calls it. Stillness meaning that everyone in this world has a singular mind. Individuality does not exist in this hypothetical world. Though there is actually an upside to this supposed ideal world. The concept of famine, war, and even segregation would not exist in this new world. To help with creation, Hikawa gets to the top of the Diet Building, which in Japan is basically the area where the government stays, and summons the god of the void, Ariman, who, in Zoroastrianism, is comparable to the Christian concept of the devil or Satan. Hikawa's idea once again has some decent ideas, but it's marred by some hypocrisy. If the idea that everyone is the same in this new world, Hikawa has effectively become a hypocrite since he alone is only able to create the world that he seeks. Unless Hikawa understands that he must become a hypocrite in order to make this new world a reality, but that also has a flaw. It proves that people must be able to think for themselves in this world. There's also the freedom ending, which is considered the neutral ending of Nocturne. I neglected to mention Yuko Takao for a while since she is probably the most complex character, because she doesn't have a reason to latch onto. She was used by Hikawa for the purpose of starting the conception and harnessing Magatsugi for the world of Shijima. When freed by the player, she sort of just lounges around since she doesn't have a reason to call her own. She doesn't collect Magatsuhi on her own since she is very weak, and really only uses the Demifiend as a means to further her own goals, albeit in a mutually cooperative manner. While doing these tasks, the false god Aradia reveals itself and occasionally takes over Yuko's body in an effort to pressure the Demifiend to decide for himself what he wants. Depending on your dialogue choices, you will either be pushed towards the demon ending, which is the bad ending, or the freedom ending. Said freedom ending has the world revert to its prior state before the conception occurred as if it never happened. Everything goes back to the way it was, but in doing so, you also broke the cycle of recreation and rebirth that God has bestowed upon the universe. Yes, God is an overarching character in SMT, but I'll get to that later. What I enjoy about the reasons is how they're presented to the player. They're shown in a really interesting looking background while you steep in thought and intrigue. They propose to you what they're striving to do and ask you if you understand and would join them in their quest. You have the option to say yes, no, or I don't know, with all three answers secretly causing a shift in the narrative depending on what you choose. But even with that knowledge, I felt like there was no choice that was correct or incorrect in the moment. If you really think about it like I and others have, there are clear upsides and downsides to all, but I enjoyed that Atlas didn't try and push you in a particular path regardless of your choice. However, as great as the reasons themselves are, they're marred by the fact that you don't feel a personal connection with any of the people who actually created them. Mainly Chiaki and Isamu, who were supposed to be your best friends from high school before the conception occurred, but we really aren't given enough time or personal moments between them all to really feel like we had a connection with any of them. So when you inevitably fight one or both of them in your pursuit, it has no emotional impact, which is something that the story as a whole lacks. When Chiaki is straight up committing genocide on the mannequins and their highly intelligent leader in order to gain more power, in a rather dark scene I might add, you would think that this would invoke a response from the player, but it just doesn't. It's just Chiaki happening her way into a place, doing her thing, and the story progresses after the fact. Same with Hajiri's death at the hands of Isama. Hajiri's been by your side, feeding you information through the Amala network for over half the game. He's been helping you out, only to go crazy, get captured by Isamu, and thrown into a pool of Magatsuhi, dying immediately. While Hajiri did have some level of emotional response, it's not enough to say it is a memorable highlight. The memorable part of this section was the birth of Noah, not Hajiri dissipating into the ether. However, in response to the mediocrity of the previous section I just talked about, there's a silver lining in the form of the Maniac's release content. The extra features added in the Maniacs version of the game were honestly paltry since the new ending that they added ended up becoming the best ending in the game by a mile, as it's by far the most satisfying ending to get compared to everything else. At the beginning, Lucifer, yes, the fallen angel of Christianity Lucifer, 
implants the Demi-Fiend with a Magatama, which is why you have that spike on your back, why you turn half-demon, and why you are able to even be a part of the Vortex world in the first place and fight and talk to demons. Because of this, Lucifer expects to see if you can challenge Kagetsuchi, which is that giant ball up in the sky. Kagetsuchi is an aspect of God, or Yahweh, or that created its own universe. The person who is able to fight Kagetsuchi, win, and prove their strength to it, allows Kagetsuchi to shape the world to your will. This is how everyone in the Vortex world with a reason is able to make their ideas a reality. No matter what ending you choose and what reason you align with, you will have to fight Kagetsuchi as the final boss. But there's an extra caveat to getting the true ending that was added in the Maniacs re-release. On top of adding the Labyrinth of Amala, it also houses some of the best bosses in the game, two new great companions to recruit, and most importantly, you get context on the world and the cycle of the universe by talking to Lucifer and his assistant at the end of reaching each Kalpa. By getting this exposition, you learn the origins of certain characters and their fates. Ikawa caused the conception by killing a bunch of people using demons in that park at the beginning of the game. When God realized that the world was being consumed by hatred and such things were happening, he realized that it was time for the conception to occur, which is pretty intriguing. And it explains Aradia's origin, since there are multiple universes known as the Amala universe. One of the worlds created and destined to be born never was, and that causes what's known as false gods to be created. Aradia is one of those false gods, who wanders from dimension to dimension in hopes to find someone to inherit her ideology so they can get their powers back. And it explains Hijiri's fate after death, or supposed death. You remember him, right? Well, it turns out that it's a heavily implied fan theory that Hijiri is actually the protagonist from Shin Megami Tensei 2. How is this possible? So, in the events of Shin Megami Tensei 2, a specific hero, the main character, if you will, of that series, went against God and prevailed, and God then proceeded to curse him for an eternity. Now, it is heavily theorized that Hajiri is actually the protagonist of the second Shin Megami Tensei game, and since we know how the Amal Network and multiverses you know, kind of operate, chances are, yeah, that could be him. There's a lot of other uh, just references to it. I'm just speaking offhandedly, but it's kind of neat that they sort of reference that. But it's also awful, because Hajiri probably just died, or Aleph, if you want to call him that. And he just got, he's probably gonna get reincarnated into another single body and get tortured again. It's gonna suck. That is extremely harrowing to think about. All of this is fascinating and further adds to the incredible lore of Shin Megami Tensei. But when you reach the bottom, you are locked into the true ending, where Lucifer gives some of his power to the demi -fiend. And in return, the demi -fiend himself abandons any and all humanity he had left in order to become arguably the most powerful demon in the Vortex world, possibly almost as, if not stronger, than Lucifer himself. At the end of everything, after climbing the Tower of Kagetsuchi, killing your former friends along the way, and making your way to the creator of this universe, you fight against him, kill him, doom the world entirely for rejecting a reason, and the only thing you can do now is wage war against God himself. Why do this? Well, Lucifer plans to destroy Kagetsuchi so that he and his demon army and the Demi-Fiend can fight and challenge God in a fight for true freedom and liberation from Yahweh. The trade-off, that being that if you kill Kagetsuchi without a reason, the world and universe is literally doomed. Much like one of Aradia's worlds. When you achieve this task, the final challenge awaits you. The final secret boss against Lucifer himself is one of my favorite final boss fights in any game. And when you prove your worth to Lucifer, he speaks and announces that a new demon of darkness has been born. In eternal darkness, you and the army of demons march forward to wage war against God himself. And the game ends. It's left ambiguous on purpose, and I think that's the right choice. In this world of SMT, the current law is that if God believes that humanity has become too free or gone against his own will, then he will begin the conception again. There's only one way to break that cycle, killing the one who would cause that creation and standing up for what you believe is right. But in order to do this, there's a cost, much like everything else. Everything and everyone you've ever known will disappear. 
Do you think you could do it? And that's why this ending is one of the best endings I've played through. SMT Nocturne is a surprisingly complex game with wonderful themes of creation and perseverance. While the main plot itself is rather thin, it's these ideas, the art design, and wonderful atmosphere and world that aid in presenting the case for Nocturne's main theme. And therefore, it's why I believe Nocturne is a special game. Nocturne is a sadly underrated gem for the PS2. Upon the game's release, Nocturne was praised by critics and players alike, but when it came to sales, Nocturne unfortunately disappointed, selling only at most 245,000 copies worldwide, even with the Maniacs re-release in the West a year later. It's unfortunate, since Nocturne is considered a behemoth of its genre for its mechanical depth and complex themes. The sales clearly wasn't enough to completely destroy Nocturne's legacy, as it was eventually remastered in HD for the PS4, Nintendo Switch, and personal computer in May of 2021. Nocturne's legacy and blueprint has lived on in Atlas's games ever since. From the spin-offs to its follow-up, Nocturne's DNA has remained. I'm glad that people continue to remember Nocturne all these years later, since it's worth playing again. Yes, gameplay is frustrating in some areas, and the main story lacks emotional depth, but its complex themes of creation and ideology has made me want to jump back in and experience the tale of SMT3 Nocturne all over again. And I'm glad that Atlas was able to continue on with the franchise and Shin Megami Tensei, even after Nocturne didn't meet sales expectations. I mean, hey, Nocturne even has a sneak peek at Atlas's next title, so let's look at that. Rend, slaughter, devour your enemies. There is no other way to survive. You cannot escape your hunger. Warriors of Purgatory. So yeah, I'm back. Surprisingly quickly, as some of you might have noticed. Only like a few months of a break compared to my last retrospective, taking over a year. What's up with that? Well, I had motivation to get this one off the ground for once, plus I wanted to make this end Digital Devil Saga a part of a series in a way, before I make my videos on Persona 3, 4, and 5. Besides, I really do like Nocturne, and I wanted to talk about it in an essay format, which is obviously what you just saw. I will be doing other games too, but since I had the drive to finally get off my ass and just do the work for these videos, I put my ass into gear and got them done. I hope to continue that with the DDS duology. If not, I will be very disappointed in myself. Thank you all for watching as well. I really appreciate it. I'll be seeing you all in the junkyard. Things have gone.